வணக்கம் ஃபாலோயிங் ஆல் த ஸ்டெப்ஸ் ஆஃப் அ ஃப்ளெக்ஸா டெண்டன் ரீகன்ஸ்ட்ரக்ஷன் வில் கெட் அஸ் அ குட் ரிசல்ட் பட் வாட் வி வாண்ட் இஸ் நாட் ஜஸ்ட் அ குட் ரிசல்ட் பட் அன் எக்ஸலன்ட் ரிசல்ட் அண்ட் த டிஃபரன்ஸ் பிட்வீன் குட் ரிசல்ட் அண்ட் எக்ஸலன்ட் ரிசல்ட் இன் ஃப்ளெக்ஸா டெண்டன் ரீகன்ஸ்ட்ரக்ஷன் இஸ் டிசைடட் பை த மெத்தட் இன் விச் வி ஹேவ் டன் த புல்லி ரீகன்ஸ்ட்ரக்ஷன் அண்ட் இட் இஸ் திஸ் டாபிக் ஆஃப் புல்லி ரீகன்ஸ்ட்ரக்ஷன் தி இண்டிகேஷன்ஸ் த கான்ட்ரா இண்டிகேஷன்ஸ் த சர்ஜிக்கல் டெக்னிக் அண்ட் தி டிஃப்ரெண்ட் டெக்னிக்ஸ் தட் ஆர் டன் தட் ஆர் கோயிங் டு பி டெல்ட் வித் இன் திஸ் வீடியோ We shall deal with the flexor pulley reconstruction under the following headings introduction and relevant anatomy indications and contraindications for the procedure the goals of reconstruction and the principles involved the surgical technique the post operative physiotherapy and the complications that can occur first of all why do we need to do a pulley reconstruction it is important to restore the biomechanics of the flexion movement that occurs and to restore the strength of the flexion of the digit having understood why we need to do a pulley reconstruction we also need to understand what are the goals that we need to achieve we need to restore the position of the flexor tendons in the flexor sheath and to create a reconstruction that is of sufficient length and tension to hold the tendons near the bone but not restrict the excursion of the tendons over the level of the metacarpophalangeal joint is the first pulley called the first annular pulley a1 the next pulley is over the proximal 2/3 of the proximal phalanx this is the a2 pulley over the proximal interphalangeal joint is the next annular pulley called the a3 pulley and over the middle of the middle phalanx is the next annular pulley called the a4 pulley over the distal interphalangeal joint and base of the terminal phalanx is the a5 pulley so as we have seen the a1 pulley is over the metacarpophalangeal joint it has a length of about 7.9 mm the a2 pulley over the proximal phalanx has an average length of 16.8 mm this is the most important pulley as far as the biomechanics of the tendons are concerned the a3 pulley over the proximal interphalangeal joint has a length of about 2.8 mm and the a4 pulley over the middle phalanx has a length of 6.7 mm and the a5 pulley over the distal interphalangeal joint has a length of 4.1 mm both the pulleys over the pip and the dip joint are attached to the palmar plates so when planning the reconstruction of the pulleys we need to remember that it is the a2 and a4 pulleys that are most important and must be reconstructed there are three main indications for performing a flexor pulley reconstruction the first is patients with spontaneous pulley insufficiency due to trauma the second is patients with post traumatic or post infective pulley insufficiency and the third is patients with post operative pulley insufficiency this so called spontaneous pulley insufficiency usually occurs as an injury as a result of climbing activities for example in rock climbing the entire weight of the body is borne by the acute fle- acutely flexed interphalangeal joints and this may lead to a rupture of the a2 pulley commonly this rupture of the pulley may be complete or partial when the other pulleys are intact symptoms may be manageable with the ring or other support after the rupture the patients may recall something tearing in their finger subsequently there will be pain with gripping local tenderness and decreased finger dexterity this may lead on to complete rupture or a pip joint flexion contracture may develop the second indication is the patient with the post traumatic pulley insufficiency with either damage to the skin or the pulleys or the soft tissue surrounding the flexor tendons these patients typically require staged flexor reconstruction when we examine a patient for whom a flexor tendon reconstruction has been done 6 months earlier and we find that the full passive range of movement is available but the active range is not full it means that there are only two reasons it could be adhesions or a pulley disruption or the absence of pulleys this can be confirmed by ultrasound or mri these investigations may reveal the bow stringing or the increased distance between the bone and the tendon while flexion is being carried out
Apart from visualizing the flexor tendons, the annular pulleys also can be analyzed, especially with the high resolution ultrasound. They appear as thin anisotropic bands over the flexor tendons on transverse scans. The volar portion appears hyperechoic, whereas the lateral portion of the annular pulleys appears hypoechoic. Dynamic scanning can be done to distinguish the fixed pulley system from the gliding flexor tendons. This ultrasound picture shows the important A2 annular pulley. MRI can visualize the annular pulleys on the sagittal and axial views. The third category of patients requiring pulley reconstruction would be the patients with post-operative pulley insufficiency which could occur after aggressive trigger finger release or after tendon repair or after tenolysis or even surgery for tenosynovitis with destroyed pulleys. Like in this patient who has a tuberculous tenosynovitis involving the ring finger and on exploration demonstrated involvement of the flexor sheath and the pulleys through the entire finger and involvement of the soft tissues in the palm. This patient will definitely require a pulley reconstruction later when the anti-tuberculous treatment has been started and the passive range of movements of the finger have been achieved. Having seen the indications, we also need to see the contraindications. An ischemic digit with injury to one or both the neurovascular bundles will lead to more amount of post-operative fibrosis which may compromise the results. Digits with poor skin cover are also generally poor candidates. It's usually not wise to pass a pulley graft under a skin graft. We need to avoid pulley reconstruction when doing a tendon graft. If both procedures are indicated, then only a staged tendon reconstruction is ideal. And that brings us to the important question of when the pulley reconstruction is done. The pulley should not be reconstructed at the time of either direct repair, single stage tendon grafting or tenolysis because in the post-operative period, early active motion protocol may be started and this will stretch the pulley that has been reconstructed. Secondly, if immobilization protocol is followed, it may favor adhesion formation again, compromising the results of the pulley reconstruction. So the pulley reconstruction is usually done in two main situations. First is along with stage tendon reconstruction, that is the stage one of the procedure where the tendon implant is applied or in the situation where there is an intact tendon or a healed tendon graft where there is a bowstringing of the tendon due to the insufficiency of the pulleys. Before we go into the main types of reconstruction, we need to consider a few factors. The size of the pulley that must be reconstructed, the height of the reconstructed pulleys, the strength of the reconstruction, the possible materials that can be used for the reconstruction, the location in which the pulleys are going to be reconstructed, the different techniques that can be employed and the possible pressure at which the reconstructed pulley should be tensioned. Considering the size of the pulleys that must be reconstructed, we know that the lengths of the A2 and A4 pulleys are approximately 16.8 mm and 6.7 mm respectively. For one loop around the phalanx, we need 6 to 8 cm of graft. The width of the palmaris graft is about 5 mm. So each loop around the bone provides 5 mm of length of the pulley. So we need a minimum of 3 loops for A2 pulley and 2 loops for the A4 pulley. To achieve this, we need 18 to 24 centimeters of tendon graft for A2 pulley reconstruction alone and 12 to 16 centimeters of tendon graft for A4 pulley reconstruction alone. The materials that can be used for reconstruction can be the autogenous tendon graft which could be either extrasynovial donor tendon like the palmaris longus, extensor indices proprius or the extensor digiturum longus or an intrasynovial donor tendon graft like the flexor digiturum longus or extensor retinaculum or a hemislip of the flexor digiturum superficialis. There are other materials also like the biological materials like bovine pericardial graft, acellular dermal matrix or even vascularized pulley grafts. Synthetic materials have also been used for pulley reconstruction like silicone which was used in 1968, dacron 
used in 1974, nylon and polytetrafluoroethylene or PTFE. Among these, the PTFE has shown a lot of promise as it does not interfere with the normal tendon healing process in an in vivo chicken model. It is strong enough to allow immediate mobilization of the digits without fear of pulley rupture and it is incorporated by the host tissues. It elicits no foreign body reaction and causes no additions. But generally, the autogenous tendon grafts are the commonly used materials for reconstruction. As far as the techniques of pulley reconstruction are concerned, there are two general categories. The first is those techniques that do not encircle the phalanx. And the second is the looped techniques that go around the phalanx. The commonly done procedure under the first category is the kleinert whaleby technique which is otherwise called the woven shoelace technique. Here, it involves weaving a tendon through the always present fibrous rim of the original pulley. So, this original rim is used for the reconstruction. The advantage of this technique, which was first described by Weilby and modified by Kleinert, is that it affords the surgeon a good control over setting the tension in the reconstructed pulley. But the disadvantage of the technique is that it lacks immediate strength compared to, to the other reconstructive techniques. The commonest among the looped techniques is the Okutsu triple loop technique. This technique was described by Okutsu as a modification of the original Bunnell technique. Bunnell had used a single loop of tendon around the bone to create the pulley, but this was believed to be too narrow. So three loops of tendon graft were used around the phalanx, that is the proximal phalanx or the middle phalanx to reconstruct the pulleys. The obvious advantage is that it is the strongest of the pulley reconstruction techniques and can stand as much load to failure as a normal pulley. Though the excursion resistance of this technique has been shown to be superior to that of the kleinert whaleby technique, it has been proved that it is inferior to the Lister's or the Karev's technique which are going to be discussed further on. The next technique to be discussed is the Karev belt loop technique. Here, two transverse incisions are made in the volar plate and the flexor tendon is slid through the two incisions, something like a belt loop which is formed between the two incisions. This technique can be used even for reconstructing the A1 pulley, but obviously it can only be used if adjunctive flexor tendon repair or tendon grafting or implant is done and not for simple pulley reconstruction around an intact tendon. The biggest advantage of this technique is that it is biomechanically the most efficient because it is closest to the joint, it has average strength more than the Kleinert Whaleby and Lister techniques. But the disadvantages are that more tension is exerted on the underlying flexor tendon and there is an increase in total friction and work as the increased tension on the flexor tendon inhibits the gliding. The fourth technique that is the Lister's technique utilizes a segment of the extensor retinaculum which is reversed and then passed around the phalanx. It has the advantage that the retinaculum provides a smooth gliding surface and the lowest amount of resistance among the reconstructive techniques is seen in this technique. It has the following disadvantages in that a normal structure of the extremity has to be violated to harvest the retinaculum. It has the lowest mechanical efficiency and needs a very low load to cause failure. The loop and a half technique was described by Widstrom. Here a tendon graft was passed around the phalanx and then through the substance of one limb of itself. The two free ends then are sutured to the respective sides of the loop and then the whole construct is rotated away from the flexor tendon so, the, so that the sutures move away from the tendon side. It is advantageous in that it has equivalent mechanical effectiveness to most of the other techniques, but the disadvantages are that it is ineffective at preventing bow stringing because of the limited length and subsequently it leads to an increase in excursion required for digital flexion. Now we shall see the steps of the actual surgical procedure of pulley reconstruction. It is usually done under local anesthesia and epinephrine or what is known as the Valant procedure, wide awake, local anesthesia, no tourniquet. 
This gives better adjustment of the pulley tension over an intact tendon because the patient can actively flex the finger after the pulley is reconstructed. However, in some situations, general anesthesia or regional anesthetic under tunique may be done, but we need to remember that tensioning is more difficult because only passive motion can be assessed intraoperatively. The incisions that are used are usually the Brunner incision or the midaxial incision. The pulley system is explored, specifically the A2 and the A4 pulleys. If there are any remnants of these pulleys, they must be preserved. Now, at this stage, three important steps must be done. All scarred pulley tissues should be resected. They are mechanically abnormal and will not withstand normal forces, hence they should be removed. All scar posterior to the tendon must be excised till we reach the phalanges or the volar plates. Usually, a wedge of scar forms behind the bowstrung tendon. If this is not identified and excised, the pulley may be reconstructed over the scar and the procedure will fail. And thirdly, all additions must be released. Full tendon gliding must be restored before pulley reconstruction can be done. Now that the bed has been prepared, the graft can be harvested. In cases of closed rupture, palmaris longus autograft or the extensa retinaculum can be harvested as a graft. On the other hand, if the pulley is being reconstructed over a tendon implant, the flexardistum superficialis can be used if it is being excised, the palmaris longus can be used and in cases in which none of these are available, a plantaris or even a flexar allograft can be considered. Now the harvested graft must be positioned and sutured. When the loop technique is used, the suturing is different for the A2 pulley reconstruction and the A4 pulley reconstruction. For the A2 pulley reconstruction, a minimum of 3 to 4 loops must be passed volar to the extensor mechanism, that is, between the extensor tendon and the lateral bands and the proximal phalanx. This is looped around the flexor tendons and sutured to itself. For reconstruction of the A4 pulley, minimum of 2 to 3 loops must be passed dorsal to the extensor mechanism, that is, dorsal to the conjoint and lateral bands, oblique retinacular ligaments, and the triangular ligament and the skin. When the Whaleby technique is used, the graft is woven through the remaining rim of the pulleys in the form of a shoelace, and suturing is done with 4 0 non absorbable suture. Now comes the important step of tensioning. The reconstructed pulley must not be tensioned too tight or too loose. This can be assessed both visually and by palpation. The flexor tendons should remain in close contact to the phalangeal surface but have free unimpeded motion through the active digital flexion. The graft is then fixed to the remnants of the normal pulley and to itself using 3-0 or 4-0 non-absorbable suture. If the pulley is built around intact tendons, active tendon motion should be tested again at this time. We need to remember at this point that active motion can be worse after surgery than intraoperatively, but it will not be better. This is the last and best chance to ensure that the new pulley is located and tensioned correctly and that the underlying tendon or implant is not restricted in its motion. Excellent hemostasis, skin suturing, dressing and a dorsal blocking splint are applied. If the pulley reconstruction has been done over tendon implants, post-operative assessment of the pulley reconstruction can be done by x-rays alone. The reconstructed pulley should be snug. If rods are seen to bowstring, then the pulleys are too loose. If the rods are seen to buckle, then the pulleys are too tight. Physiotherapy plays an important role in pulley reconstruction also. In the recovery area, gentle passive flexion and if the tendons are intact, place and hold exercises can be done within the post-operative dressing. After the first dressing change, a dorsal blocking splint can be fabricated with the pulley strap to support the reconstructed pulley or pulleys. This should be worn between exercise sessions and at night for the first month after surgery. For two weeks only, if the pulley reconstruction is made over a passive tendon splint, the later therapy will depend on whether the pulley has been built over an intact tendon or an tendon implant. If the pulley reconstruction has been done over an intact tendon, after 4 weeks a thermoplastic pulley ring is usually fabricated and the patient can begin to wear the ring and remove the splint more regularly. The pulley ring should be used regularly for several months as the pulley graft continues to heal. At 6 weeks, the splint can be discontinued 
and light resistive exercise is begun. At 12 weeks after surgery, heavier resistance can be instituted and the pulley ring can be discontinued except for heavy gripping. But if the pulley reconstruction had been done over a tendon implant, the body taping is usually instituted at 3 to 4 weeks and the patient can gradually resume light activity as we need to wait for the scar to soften in time for the stage 2 surgery. But we need to be vigilant for signs of synovitis which is the most common complication after stage 1 surgery. As far as the complications are concerned, it has been reported that the commonest complications following staged flexor reconstruction are flexor contracture, synovitis, infection and pulley failure. Of these, the first three are not directly related to the pulley reconstruction that has been done, but they do influence these complications. For instance, stiffness and flexion contracture can be caused by a tight graft. Inadequate excision of the scar wedge which is posterior to the tendon can cause this. Lateral x-rays intraoperatively can ensure that the new pulley is built on a foundation of bone and not scar. When the pulley is reconstructed over the scar tissue and the scar wedge, the tendon tends to become tight. The complication of synovitis may or may not be a result of pulley reconstruction, but excessively tight pulleys do play a role. During pulley reconstruction, the passive range of movement should be checked intraoperatively operatively to ensure adequate gliding of the tendon through the reconstructed pulleys. The infection usually occurs due to the tendon implant within the flexor sheath and usually an infected implant is preceded by synovitis which in turn is due either to excessive activity or poor implant gliding resulting in implant buckling. The reconstructed pulley itself may fail due to rupture of the pulley, loosening of the pulley, tightening of the pulley or bone complications. The bone complications that can be seen are excessive bone resorption or secondary fractures developing due to the ischemia of the bone in the encircled segments by the loops. I hope you liked the video. Please click on the shown links to see more about the basics of flexor tendon reconstruction and the surgical techniques that are involved in the single and the multiple stage reconstructions.